Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pamela Riccia, and this is episode number 103 of the podcast. It's the 19th of December, 2017, as I record this intro. My guest this week is Milva McDonald. Milva unschooled her four now adult children starting back in 1991, the year before we started. And this year, she published a book of essays about their experience titled Slow Homeschooling. We have a great conversation diving into her family's unschooling journey, how music has woven its way through their lives, unschooling's gift of time, college, and lots more. As a personal update, I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time to participate in my survey. I really appreciate the over 300 responses, and I'm excited to dive in after the holidays and shape an amazing 2018 with you. As for today, I'm prepping the rest of this year's podcast episodes to go out in anticipation of Lissy arriving home for the holidays tomorrow. I'm looking forward to a week steeped in play. Board games, card games, baking, hiking, hot tub soaking, movies, and lots of conversations. And it turns out we get to stay home for all our celebrations this year because I'm hosting. That's going to be fun. And I want to send a huge thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon and a big welcome to new patron, Beth Hardwick. You guys inspire me to keep exploring the fascinating world of unschooling. And I really appreciate your support in sharing unschooling information with anyone who's curious to learn more about this wonderful lifestyle. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week's quote is from Milva. The things that they chose to pursue when they were older are very connected to the playing and exploring that they did when they were younger. And I feel like for even all of us as adults, that's when we get the most joy out of life, when we're getting that spirit of play into whatever we're doing. I found this as well. Looking back, so often we can see the threads of connection between the things our children have chosen to play with over the years, right into the things they choose to do as they get older. Not that they are necessarily direct connections, like a love of music to becoming a professional musician, but the deeper theme that connects the why behind the choices. It may be a bent of artistic expression or of being a helper. We come to recognize how many of their choices over the years related to their exploration of different aspects of that theme, filling in their understanding of its bigger picture. The challenge is that we see that path in retrospect. We can't see it laid out into the future. And that's where trust comes in. I also think that maybe this jumped out at me because with the holidays around the corner, I'm intentionally getting more deeply into the spirit of play. It really is for everyone. And I'm recording a short intro for next week's episode right after this. So I will see you in the new year with the next full intro. Wishing you and your family a lovely holiday season of joyful play. And now on to my conversation with Milva. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Milva McDonald. Hi, Milva. Hi, Pam. Hi. Just as a bit of an introduction, Milva homeschooled her four now adult children starting back in 1991, which is the year before I started. She also wrote for the Boston Globe and Boston.com covering arts and cultural events in Boston. And this year, she published a book of essays about their homeschooling experience titled Slow Homeschooling. I'm really looking forward to chatting with her about her family's experience. And to get us started, Milva, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Yes, absolutely. I'm looking forward to chatting as well. Thanks for having me. Um, My kids are 
32 to 19. My oldest daughter is 32. She's expecting, so I'm excited about becoming a grandmother this spring. Yay! My, yeah, my son is 30, and uh, then my two younger daughters are 20 and 19. And we started homeschooling, as you said, back in 1991 when my oldest daughter was six um, as a result of me sort of not being thrilled with her kindergarten experience and looking for options. And I had a friend at the time who homeschooled. Um, and when she told me that she did this, I just thought it was the nuttiest idea I had ever heard. <laughs> but then I, I never imagined doing it. Um, I never even knew it was possible. But then uh, my daughter's kindergarten experience wasn't satisfactory to me. And I started looking for options. And I because I'm so thorough, and when I uh, research something, I like to research everything. Um, I start I asked my friend for some reading material. And I started reading and I said, Wow, this, this sounds like something I could I'd really love to do. And I never looked back. So do you remember what it was that uh, really caught your attention when you were reading? Yeah, it was actually an essay by John Taylor Gatto. Um, and that was really, I, I call it my one and only conversion experience. I've never really felt so so definitively sure about something as I did when I read that essay and realized that I wouldn't send my kids to school. Um, so, but I always like to say that even though my homeschooling started because I was dissatisfied with the school experience, it really... It, it stuck because homes because of homeschooling because homeschooling really worked and because of all the benefits of homeschooling not because it was a reaction to school so it kind of started that way but very quickly I don't think we would have kept going if it was just a reactionary um, activity <laughs> we did we kept going because it was something that really worked great and so it was really the benefits of homeschooling that kept me going not, um, what I didn't like about my daughter's school experience. I think that is such a great point because I found that that as well. You know, at first we're choosing it because in reaction to something that's not working for us. Right. And yeah. but eventually as you um, start to understand it and you see the benefits, yeah, that becomes your reason because you're right. You know, you're not going to hold on to that anger or or frustration or whatever it was that pushed you to look for something new, you're not going to hold on to that forever. Right. Right. So it, that can't be, um, uh, like a motivation to carry you on years and years. So I remember that shift when I realized, Oh, you know what? Like, this is so great. I'm choosing this just because of itself, not because of all the other things. Right. Absolutely. And I also, I remember at the time just making that choice, kind of freed me up in so many other ways because once I realized, oh, I can do this, I can educate my kids in this way that society sees as different, I I don't have to do any of these prescribed things. I can just choose what I want, um, how I want to live my life. It, it was very freeing for me beyond that one choice. So Yeah. <clears throat> It, it's really empowering, isn't it? Because when yeah. you re yeah, you realize you can own one choice, then you, you start looking around. It's like, oh, what do I really think about this and about this, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, music has been a big thing in your family, and I would love to hear how it has woven its way through your lives over the years. Yeah, well, my husband is a musician, so and my actually my first husband was a musician, so my my four kids, um, I are from two different husbands. <laughs> Sometimes that confuses people, but um, so, and I've always loved music. So because their dads were musicians, my kids were always around music. Um, and also we did music things together. So I love to, I'm an amateur singer. I love to sing. We all sang in an intergenerational chorus um, when my kids were younger. And that, you know, that was, really meaningful in so many ways um, because we were in a we were in a community of people and I remember this one story about when my son was an adolescent uh, during the rehearsals for the intergenerational chorus he would he was sort of getting antsy and he was moving around and I didn't know what was going on he wasn't singing where he was supposed to be and then one day 
he, my husband said to me, you know, when he's ready to stand with the men, he'll stand with the men. And, and I sort of had this light bulb moment and realized that he was sort of, that's what he was doing. His voice was changing and he was transitioning. And it was sort of this ability for me to observe my son moving, doing this sort of tra- transformation, literal life transformation in, it was, it was a metaphor for what he was going through <laughs> in you know, which was really cool. And so just um, being together a lot and going to concerts a lot and actually making music together. Um, we used to have kids come over. My husband would lead jams. Uh, my We used to go to open mics and perform. Um, and then my daughter, my 20 year old got really into jazz. We had this was one of those surprise things that happens when you're homeschooling. We knew she loved to sing. We knew she was a good singer. We knew she loved music, but somehow jazz hadn't found its way onto, you know, our our um, record our music scene for some reason. And then when she was 11, my husband just put an uh, Ella Fitzgerald uh, recording on our MP3 player, and she heard that, and it was like that was it for her. She spent the next two years or more obsessively listening to Ella Fitzgerald and then she moved on to Miles Davis and other jazz musicians and it was really an intensive study for her. Um, By the time she was 12 she knew every solo that Ella Fitzgerald had ever sung. Um, She started singing jazz herself and and she and she had a lot of space to do that on her own. She would just explore music. Then we started going to jazz jams. So Mm (laughs) So, you know, and there she learned things. She learned a lot besides she learned more about music, but she also learned how to count off tunes and like practical skills that musicians use. Um, She learned those also by going to the jams. Um, So, I mean, I think also there's so much research now about how music helps kids brains and all this stuff that we probably knew all along. But now science is telling us oh, guess what? (laughs) So, um, so I do, so music was huge for us. And like I said, not surprising since my husband's a musician, but, um, it played a part in, you know, our lives in the community. And, um, also I feel like even though not all my kids will become musicians, although one or two of them might, (laughs) um, music is something that they can have for their whole lives and, and enjoy and love. So, I think it's, yeah, yeah. it was a great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when I was reading that section in the book as well, what, what came to me was, um, you know, that, like you said, your husband's were musicians, are musicians, and it was just something that you, you guys enjoyed. Um, so it, it felt like it was kind of just it was part of your family. Right. And oh, there were, yeah, there was no obligation for the kids, but it was something that your family was kind of steeped in. It was part of the conversation, part of the threads through your days. And I was imagining, you know, for other families, it may be a different kind of topic. But so often we have um, some things that uh, grow grow into kind of like family interests, right? Something that uh, just uh, even are the background of our days, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that is definitely true. And so, I mean, they all eventually took lessons when they asked to to take lessons. But Mm -hmm. actually, my daughter, who's the jazz singer, she took like a few voice lessons when she was a teenager. Um, She was very short lived and she never really picked up an instrument. She started asking to take piano lessons when she was 10 because she had been in this production of The Sound of Music that summer and the woman who played Maria, she really respected. She was an amazing singer. And during a conversation, she told my daughter that she had taken piano lessons and she felt that that was an important uh, thing for her to develop skills as a musician. So that's what made my daughter decide to ask to learn piano. Um, So they, and they never, so it wasn't like we, said, oh, we're going to create this situation where you guys learn music. It was Mm -hmm. definitely an exposure thing. And they just and they did it with us and they grew to love and appreciate it. 
and want to study it on their own terms, in their own ways, because they're all very different. Um, my oldest daughter was a singer-songwriter. My son is a professional musician now, and he plays Celtic music, so he's a folk musician. And Claire loves the jazz, and Abby, the youngest, she liked to play classical. But for her, it's definitely, you know, she enjoys doing it, but she's not going to pursue it as a career. At least mm -hmm. not now, but who knows? She could change her mind. <laughs> that's... Well, that's a fascinating thing, right? Music is a whole world, you know, yeah. you, there's just so many places you can go with it. If somebody says, gee, I wish my kids really enjoyed music. Like, you know, like you said, if you're, you think about the research and, oh, music's good for your brain and everything. But the difference is if, if we as parents think something is valuable, then it's valuable for us. Yeah. Right. So it's not about trying to um, convince our kids or, or co you know, just try to cajole them to try it out. Just try it out. Try out piano or whatever. Right. It's not about right. that. But if it's something that we think would be awesome, we can enjoy it. And, you know, maybe they will see our enjoyment. Maybe they'll join us and we'll have fun together. But in the end, we've still gained a lot of enjoyment. Right. So it's a, about yeah. us grabbing hold of these things for ourselves. Absolutely. First. And I think I, I make that point in the essay in the book where one of the important pieces, if you want to, if you want your kids to love music or whatever, is modeling that you just, you do it, you love it. And then they see that as an example and they, and then they might decide they want to try it or they might not. And that's the you know, sometimes you sort of have to come to terms with, I mean, I thought my daughter would love classical singing because she used to, when she was like six, she used to, she, she had listened, we had this Mozart tape and she would go around the house singing the queen of the night aria. Um, but she didn't do, she didn't gravitate towards that in the way that she gravitated to jazz. So that was definitely not something that we, tried to convince her to do. Um, it was completely her own. So that's, so when you model the love for it and they see it and they try it out, they're going to pick things up, but it's going to definitely be their own things. The same way we as our own selves gravitate towards certain things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that reminds me of <clears throat> a couple of weeks or a few weeks ago, anyway, um, Emma and I talked on the podcast about John Holt's Escape from Childhood, and he talked a lot about um, us, you know, doing, not not putting things on our kids, not making these activities about us, you know, or, mm -hmm. or about them, or, you know, having to do them for them. So we're modeling them, but we're modeling them because we are choosing them right. for ourselves. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So so you don't necessarily think about the fact that you're modeling it while you're yeah. doing it. <laughs> exactly. You're just living together. But it's about about um, making choices for ourselves and knowing it's okay if I, you know, really enjoy this. And you know what? If I'm really enjoying listening to music and it's bothering my kids, I'm going to put headphones on, you know, because we're living together. But they yes. know, they see what we're doing. We see what they're doing. Sometimes we, like, I imagine you guys started enjoying jazz a lot more along with your daughter, right? Because, I guess, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. I learned so much about, I mean, I learned so much about jazz that I, cause I hadn't really listened to jazz before. So, I mean, that's, and that's the other piece that we end up learning from them so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> okay. Um, we should probably move on. <laughs> In another one of your essays um, in the book uh, titled The Gift of Time, you share that your kids benefited hugely from the simple availability of time. And I found that as well. I think actually that turned out to be one of the most valuable aspects of our unschooling lifestyle. So I was wondering if you could share some of the benefits that you saw. Absolutely. Um, I really do think that time is, if you had to pick one thing, um, for, about homeschooling, that's the greatest, I would say, the time, the time. Mm -hmm. So one thing, uh, they have time to delve into their interests, the way my daughter was able to do the jazz. My, I have another daughter who's obsessed with Shakespeare. I mean, the, the interests go on. Everybody who homeschools knows that has seen this, their kids sort of latch on to something, and then they have the time to really deeply study it. And sometimes that's in a way that people don't think of as study. Um, when I say deeply study, I'm talking about 
you know, my daughter going into her room with her Ella Fitzgerald CDs and listening to them so many times that they were embedded into her brain. And she learned about all the phrasing and all kinds of things just from doing that. So I consider that deep study. It doesn't mean that she, you know, went, sat down with books or, I mean, she did that. (laughs) But um, So, so there's that. There's also time to develop relationships. The family time to me, I mean, it, it was such a wonderful lifestyle and we really had time to be together as a family. Also, everybody had time to be on their own. Um, a lot of people I know travel. We didn't do a lot of that, but um, time to take trips, travel and learn that way. Um, I also am a big believer in the benefits of free play. And so especially when kids are little, when you homeschool, they have a lot of time to play. And that really, I think, is the most important piece of their learning um, is play. So um, and and I think when I wrote that essay, I started with the story I had just uh, met. I had just talked to a dad whose daughter had been pulled out of school in junior high. And I asked him how she was doing. And he said she's doing so well. She really has time now to live her life and do things that she enjoys and she's so much happier. So, and, and that to me is also a big benefit is just happiness and feeling like you're enjoying life now. Um, so those are some of the things that I can think of about time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And along with like the relationships, the, the time to that free time to explore it, it helps them, um, learn so much about themselves too, doesn't it? Absolutely. I that is self knowledge is huge, hugely important, um, because it it helps them through their whole lives. When you know yourself, you develop self awareness. I think I wrote also an essay about titled self awareness and resiliency. um, And because my one of the other interests that my daughter had besides jazz was psychology, and she had gone to a seminar and she came home and she was talking about how they um, this, the topic of the seminar was self-awareness and how it fosters resiliency. And I hadn't really thought about that before. And I thought that really makes sense. And one of the things that you get from having the time to be to delve into what you care about and also time to be alone is sort of knowing yourself. So self-awareness is hugely important for all of us. And I think that homeschooling really helps with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, too. And similar to that gift of time, but still distinct in its own way, solitude is also valuable, isn't it? Definitely. I mean, it's I think it's valuable for all of us, whether we're kids or adults. um, But and I mean, and different. It's valuable for everybody, no matter what your personality is. But I've seen with my own kids, I have a couple of extroverts and I have a couple of introverts. So, you know, you would think, oh, the introverts really need time alone and they do, but the extroverts really need the time alone too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, we all need time alone. And especially I think when you're growing up, I mean, uh, the, one of the things I think play is so great for is processing. It's one of the ways that kids process kind of what they see around them and try to figure things out. But they also use their time alone to process and think about, you know, what they've seen, what they're what they're learning. And um, that's something that if you are just really super busy and you never have time alone, you don't get to do that as much. Um, So that was one of the themes of slow homeschooling, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I found fascinating is um, that oftentimes when they're taking that um, solitude, that time to themselves to process, et cetera, it's not, it wasn't like they were um, sitting, you know, in a corner by themselves, um, like knowingly, oh, I need to process, I need to think through things. But they were doing, often doing uh, more of a comforting kind of activity or something. I know um, Lissy would spend hours on the swing outside with her music right swinging um one other uh, joseph loves walking and would go for a walk michael would could have you know maybe his uh bow staff or just be out doing a few flips a little bit of 
of of the stuff that um, that they know really well, right? That that is almost um, wrote to them, and yeah. comforting, and that that kind of helped them with all the processing that was going on, even sometimes subconsciously, right? Absolutely. I mean, my I have one one of my kids who we had ducks and she loved those ducks and she would go out in the backyard and just spend hours just sitting with the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. And yeah, I and I'm sure that and I would just look out there. Wow. She and she knew they all, to me, all the ducks looked the same, but she knew them so well. And so I guess that wasn't technically alone time because she was with the ducks. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that was one example. They, you know, they would knit or just all, you know, different things. And sometimes I I think I wrote this in one of the essays. I didn't necessarily know what they were doing. Um, They would just go off in their rooms and I I didn't know necessarily Mm. what they were doing there. They were just having time to do whatever they needed to do. And um, that, I think, is another piece that I talk about is... um, uh, just being able to figure out their lives. Um, it just, all this helps with executive, all these buzzwords, executive function, uh, being able mm-hmm. to organize things. And I'm, I've had people say, well, did your homeschooled child have trouble when she went to college? And actually she talked about how she found that she was coping more easily than some of her classmates who had been used to being sort of told what to do up until that point. Um, and she already knew she was so for her, it was just like, Oh, I'm here now because I want to be and I know how to organize my time because I've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that that's sort of a piece of it too. They, they learn how to, they know how they want to fill their time and they know how to do it. And, um, so I think that's a huge benefit also. Yeah, yeah, that's a great thing. Yeah, half the time. To be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so over the last decade or so, um, homeschooling has grown enough in popularity that we've really become a market for a wide range of educational products, even beyond just the typical curriculum in a box. And I thought you made a great point about this. While these increased options are wonderful, they can also prolong our de-schooling, really, because of that philosophical journey we need to take to appreciate the remarkable value of these large swaths of free time in our families' lives, right? So have you seen that as well? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's really a different world today than when I started homeschooling. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you say, it is it's the options are great. One of the things I, I mean, I hear people say is that it allows people to homeschool who couldn't homeschool otherwise, which I think is great. And I believe in options, but that I think that the way that you put it, that it can prolong our de-schooling, that's absolutely true. And I think back, if at the time when I started homeschooling, if if all the things had been available that are available now, I probably would have done what I see a lot of families doing now, which is just scheduling, you know, just scheduling, <laughs> scheduling yeah, our, yeah. you know, one activity to another, um, a whole day at or more than one, two, three, sometimes four or five days at a uh, place where you drop your kid off. Um, partly you do that because you, you're nervous when you start homeschooling. Um, you you know it feels like a big responsibility, uh, and and you want to make sure you do a quote good job, um, and so and and then there's all and you're also coming from the school mindset, and so it's easy to do that, and and I think a lot of people do do that, and where what they lose, as you've said, is that de schooling time where you you're sort of figuring out that you can do things other ways and also getting the benefits of having all this time. The other thing um, I think that can be lost is this, the more organic nature of when you're in a community of homeschoolers and you're building activities or things to do together that come from the people in the group. So it just, to me, it felt, it feels more organic and it's very meaningful and um, signing your kid up for something can also be fun and meaningful, but it doesn't have the same weight as when you're with a group of people and you're building this community. Um, and that right. takes time. 
it's, mm-hmm. it's, um, it takes time, but and commitment. You know, yeah. <laughs> what I was when you were talking like the, uh, mentioning that, I think that ties back to the music and the music lessons that you were talking about too, right? Your daughter's um, connection and reason at that moment, for example, for her interest in piano lessons, right? That the mm-hmm. difference between what what they um, can what they get out of an experience when they're choosing that experience versus when we are saying, hey, this should be a good experience for you. You know what? They they may even go and have fun. But when it's not um, coming deeply from an interest that they have, um, I I don't think there there's much more opportunity, I think, for, for really deep learning and lots of connections when it's something that they're choosing and they're initiating because that's where their kind of heart and soul is sitting right now, right? There's a difference, do you think? Yes, I agree. And also, um, you know, when so when Claire did get into jazz and she wanted to explore that more, one of the things. So my husband's a musician and he said, well, we'll invite some kids over. And so we he started kids. We invited some kids over. Mostly they were homeschoolers. I think that one was in the evening. So you didn't have to be a homeschooler, but I think it was mostly homeschoolers, as I recall. And then they would come over. So that was an, quote, organized activity. But it came from you know, my daughter's real desire to do it. And also my husband, who is part of the community. And so it was just a bunch of people who knew each other playing music together and learning um, whatever my husband had to show them about like blues improvising. (laughs) So so there was more of that kind of thing where, and when my older kids um, were little, there was a mom who really wanted to do theater. So she started this theater group and they did these productions. And then my youngest daughter actually uh, started her own theater company. um, And that was actually kind of really cool and amazing. When she was 13, she came and said, I, she came to me and said, I want to do, do a production of Hamlet in the backyard this summer. I said, Oh, okay. (laughs) I'm like, sure, whatever. And I, I didn't really know if it was going to happen. I mean, this is one of the really great things that about homeschooling and unschooling is that, you know, you sit back and you watch. And if you just sometimes it doesn't happen, but then these things unfold that are just so amazing to observe. And I feel like that was this huge privilege that I got to experience. Um, So in this case, it was Hamlet. My daughter wanted to play Hamlet. She knew she would never get cast as Hamlet. So Mm -hmm. because she was 13 and a girl. So she did her own production. And I was, it was amazing how she was determined. I had no idea. She's the sort of quiet introverted one. I had no idea that this determination had been brewing in her, but we had always been going to see Shakespeare plays. Um, we took the kids cause we love them. So we said, Oh, we're going to go see these plays. So they had been exposed to Shakespeare, but this was brewing all this time. I didn't know that. And, and here it was, and she, and they did it, she did it. And then she started doing more and over a period of three years, I think they did a dozen Shakespeare productions. She wow. started a theater and this was all kids and they ran it all themselves. And, you know, it was, I'm sure that that experience, whether or not those kids go on to become actors, most of them probably won't, but just having that experience, I'm sure just meant a lot in terms of just, well, they're all really familiar with Shakespeare now and comfortable with the text, but also, just pulling that off, Mm -hmm. you know, a group of, they really can, they can do so much if, if we just let them and they, and they take it seriously, you know, they didn't think, oh, we're just a bunch of kids. We can't do Shakespeare. They didn't have that in their head. They thought, well, we can do this. Why not? Nobody has said to them, you're too young to do that. Or, um, you know, you don't know enough about Shakespeare to do that. (laughs) So, you know, those are the kinds of things that they're just so amazing to witness and observe. And that's the, that's what I feel like the some of the biggest gifts are for me as a as a parent who did this. It was mm-hmm. just miraculous. Really. I, uh, really. Right. I mean, that is an amazing story. And that's I think that that wraps it all back to time. Right. Mm-hmm. Giving our children the time to 
discover these aspects of themselves, but also the time to be able to take on these big projects of their own, right? And dive in as deep as they want versus, you know, trying to fit that around the schedule of three or four days at various things, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, and my kids, by the time they were teenagers, they were really busy because they were very active, but it was all activities of their own choosing. And, and, you know, a lot of it was my daughter was busy doing youth quake. That was the name of her theater company. So she, even though she did a lot of other things, she had the time, she wasn't in a school all day and didn't have tons of homework. So she had the time to do that. And so it's not, you know, by the time they were teenagers, they, I, I mean, I always sort of uh, compare it to the play. They had spent their childhoods playing and then they just kept doing that. So the theater company was the uh, my daughter's, you know, version of mm-hmm. playing. It was doing what we love. It was experimenting, exploring. So it's very connected to me. The things that they chose to pursue when they were older uh, is very connected to the you know, the playing that sort of exploring that they did when they were younger. And I feel like for even all of us for as adults, that's when we get the most joy out of life is when we're getting that spirit of play in into whatever we're doing. Mm -hmm. It makes such a huge difference, right? When you even realize um, that the things that you're doing are, are your choice, right? And that you can bring that open, curious, playful attitude with you to everything that you're choosing to do, right? It, it's just such a huge mind shift and makes such a difference in in how we enjoy our days. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, there was one other piece that, that I thought of while you were talking about that as well, as we were talking about t- um, time, the value of time and talking about um, certainly when we – you know, as nowadays, when you first start homeschooling and there are so many options around us, uh, the other piece I think that can slow down because, you know, it and there's nothing wrong with it because, you know, it's it's a it's a, a, a step. Right. We go step by step by step as we learn more. And, you know, maybe if that's a comfortable first step um, to do some more activities. But what. It, it can get in the way of is um, understanding how we as human beings can learn on our own, right? Because you've yeah. still got that kind of um, teacher student setup, even if it's in a, a homeschooling um, kind of environment, maybe a co op or something like that. Um, but to get to that point where you truly understand that children can learn on people human beings can learn things on their own don't always need to be taught then then you can get to the spot where you understand using these kinds of um, opportunities really are a choice it's not the best way to learn there are lots of ways to learn it's a way to learn and if that's your choice that's wonderful yeah but it yeah it's that big piece of of getting to the point where you understand that learning doesn't need to have a teacher, right? That's right. And I think, I mean, I do think that sometimes teachers are really valuable, but I, I always sort Mm. of say that I think it's that they're valuable when they're, when the teacher is chosen by the learner. And I think that sometimes happens um, when we're not even aware of it. I mean, there are some people that I look back on and I think like that woman who was in the sound of music with my daughter, when she was eight, my daughter never took lessons with her, but she was definitely a teacher of my daughter's because my daughter identified her as someone she admired and wanted to learn from. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that definitely can have, I mean, I think that there are teachers out there, but again, it's, it happens. They're just there. I think all of us have probably been teachers too, without even being aware of it at times. Mm. Um, sometimes we are aware of it and the, and the student says, I want you to teach me. And then you go, okay. <laughs> but, um, I think also, I think the main point is that when this, when the person chooses the teacher, then it's the most significant and meaningful learning. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I, you know, you get, it's so interesting too, to see, um, the, the, people's journey at the beginning too, because then there's, there's also a point where there's like kind of a 
backlash um, against formal um, environments. You know, it's like, oh, we homeschool don't even, you know, mention anything that that might be like a class or a course or whatever. And, you know, that's totally okay. That's where we are on our journey as we're figuring this stuff out. And, you know, eventually they'll get to a place where they realize, well, that may be a great environment if someone's choosing it and wanting that, you know, maybe it's the person that they really want to connect with, you know, um, it's just so fascinating to see the the give and take and uh, you know, really the whole journey that comes with that de-schooling period, that separation, as you really figure out the way learning happens, isn't it? <laughs> it absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I, it's, one of my kids loves being in a classroom. Actually, she's in college right now and she loves it. My other kids, they don't, they, they, they have enjoyed it. They have done it. I wouldn't say they have always loved it, but, um, Claire really always loved it. And, um, you know, at, at the school where she goes to, they have a system where they, they have shopping, they call it. So at the beginning of the semester, you can go around to different classes and try them out. And then you decide which ones you want to take. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and obviously there's uh, requirements too for your major. And that's the other piece that sometimes people say, well, if you let your kid do whatever they want, then how are they ever going to be able to do things that they don't want to? Sometimes people have to do that. And the answer is, well, they are smart enough to realize they grow up and they understand that that's a human thing. That's like mm -hmm. being human. <laughs> yeah. And, and they, and they want, a, they want something and they say, well, in order to get what I want, I have to do X, Y, and Z. So it's, it's something that um, it's not really an issue. I've never seen it be an issue, but um, yeah. So I do have one kid who loves the traditional classroom setting, but you know, she she got there. She doesn't, she loved being homeschooled and unschooled. And, and now she loves what she's doing in her college. And I don't know what she'll, I think she'll just keep doing what she loves because that's what she's always done. Mm -hmm. And that's what she loves right now. She, she loves the whole atmosphere. She, she really does. But again, there by choice, which makes exactly. It yeah. It makes all the difference in the world. I think, which leads nicely into the next question, too, which was uh, I wanted to talk a bit about the essay in the book, uh, Do Kids Have to Go to College? And I'd love to chat about, uh, I think my favorite line in there was, uh, there's a certain amount of irony in play when homeschooling parents expect their kids to take a traditional path. Um, so I was hoping you could exp expand a bit on what you meant by that and, uh, talk about how college is woven into your lives. So you mentioned Claire already. Yeah. So that was, I was really talking about myself there. Um, uh, that, um, cause my son, he was in caught, he went to Berkeley college of music for two years and then he quit, which is, I think, um, pretty typical, actually, they have a high dropout rate. It's less high than it used to be, but, <laughs> um, but and I was I had all these emotions about that because I didn't want him to quit. And so I sort of had to sort of look at myself and say, hey, you know, there's some irony here. You know, you raised him to do what he wanted. to do, <laughs> And now that he's doing it, you're bumming out, you know. Yeah. Um, so I sort of had to examine that and look at that. Um, and I think that's part of the process for at least for me. And I think other unschooling parents is you do have to sort of look at yourself a lot because um, you know, the, like what you were talking about before with um, trying to may have your kid do what you want them to do. I mean, we those we have those feelings as parents. And so we sort of have to look at them and we have to nurture self-awareness, too, I think, is part of the process. Mm -hmm. But um, but, you know, he quit and he just said, you know, I I'm just going to go be a musician. And that's what he did. And so and I'm really proud of him and, and it was the right decision for him. Um, but it is hard. And I've noticed this in homeschooling, right? When kids get to be teenagers, all the, you know, parents are really nervous, um, because what is my kid going to do? I mean, I think overall, all parents are nervous about that because it's this really intense time where 
you're transitioning to a different space. You know, your kids are growing up, you're, ta- you know, everybody's taking a different role here and you're not, you know, you're not the homeschooling parent anymore. Your kids are making these decisions and for better or for worse, they are going to make their own decisions. So, um, and, and I, I do feel strongly that it doesn't have to be college. Um, I've seen it with my, I mean, my oldest daughter didn't go to college. She is actually going to college now at the age of 32. Um, so she decided to go back and, um, and that's great. And Eric dropped out and Claire is in college. And my youngest, when I wrote that essay, Claire was applying to college. Um, and so she's in college and she's completely loves it. And Abby is going to college, but she's created a situation because she took community college classes. Um, when she was a teenager, she's going to graduate pretty early. She's actually going to graduate the same year as her sister. So she's doing that because she's sort of like, well, I kind of want to get this out of the way because I might need it later. But um, so they all made different decisions and there's so many different paths. Um, And, you know, that's one of the things that we when we homeschool and unschool our kids, we raise them to to be to think out of the box. I mean, they're not they're not they're not on the same course. They're not in high school where their guidance counselors are talking to them about where they're applying. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So they can make a lot of different choices. And um, and sometimes, you know, I mean, I think all parents have to deal with these kinds of feelings. But um, for homeschooling parents, I feel like it can be a little more intense because there's this pressure on us. And we have people looking at us like, oh, you think you can do a better job? And then if Mm -hmm. your kid doesn't want to go to college, it's like, oh, gee, you know, when when they ask about, did my kid get in? I think I wrote that in the essay that that's what people say. They say, so did your kid get into college? They're not they don't say, what is your child doing with, you know, what are your kids doing or what do they love or how do they, did they get into college? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If they get into college, then you're okay. You know, you did a good job. So, I mean, so it's, it's a lot of societal messages that we're all dealing with. Um, but, um, and, and I think I wrote about this in the essay too, that college is, is such a product now. Um, you know, they're, they're marketing themselves to, to these kids in this, um, really kind of crazy way. You know, um, it's really interesting because Claire, who's in college, did a study abroad last semester and, uh, she's become, um, an advisor for her school study abroad program. And I happened to read something that she wrote about her experience abroad. And I thought it was really interesting is that one of the things that she noticed about her experience studying abroad was that there was so much less handholding than there is in um, her uh, uh, experience as an American college student. Um, And I thought, wow, so even with college, um, in our culture, we're doing maybe more handholding than in other places. And, uh, so I just thought that was interesting that she, that she picked up on that. And to her, it wasn't, a, she liked, you know, she was fine with it. She liked it actually. And I find that my kids in general, when they've been put into situations, um, when, especially when they were teenagers, they didn't always like to out themselves as teenagers because then people would treat them differently and they didn't like mm-hmm. them. They didn't want to be treated differently just because they were younger. They were there because they wanted to participate. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. And it, so I guess and I what I, my point is that, you know, you're in Canada, so I don't know what the culture, you know, if high school students in Canada are pressured as much as they are in the United States. But there's a huge amount of pressure to go to college and. And it's also extremely expensive. And I think that it can tie a kid, it can tie a person down for a long time. Because if you, if you just sort of do what you're supposed to do, and you go into college, and then you graduate with all this debt, you're suddenly your life is going to be a lot different than if you were 22, and you didn't have to pay back $100,000 in loans. Mm -hmm. You you know, you're it's just going to change literally the course of people's lives, the choices that you're able to make in your 20s are going to be completely different if you're tied down with debt than if you're not. 
And so um, that's, I think, a big piece, too. Um, it, so in some ways, the people talk about college as being, you know, giving people opportunities and freedom, but there's a lot of ways in which it can really limit a person and tie a person down. I keep thinking, you know, so many people of my generation, you know, went and did things like join the Peace Corps and did all this travel in their 20s. But n- now I don't think the, those options are as feasible because people are graduating with, they have to go get jobs so they can pay their loans yeah. and necessarily jobs they love. Um, so I guess, you know, the, to me is sort of like, what do we want for our kids? What kind of lives do we want them to be able to lead and what kind of, so, and also the question that they have to answer for themselves is, you know, who do I want to be? How do I want to be in the world? These are human questions that everybody has to answer. So, um, and so when we unschool, they can look at college in the context of those kinds of questions. It's not like, oh, um, I need to go to college because I need to get a job and um, whatever. They're looking at it in the context of how do I want to live my life? You know, h- how do I want to be in the world? And I think that's a better way to look at college. Mm-hmm. And I think that that we've be grown up with the tools through, you know, homeschooling and unschooling to be, to understand themselves. You know, we talked about that self-awareness, that self-knowledge that allows them to make those choices. And the other thing is, is when they know they have the power of those choices, like your, your eldest daughter choosing to go to college now, you know, that, that this isn't an expectation at an age, right? We've gotten, yeah, we've gotten rid of that age requirement. We don't do things by age, but we make choices by exactly, as you mentioned, how the person we want to be, how we want to live in the world and the things we want to do. It's, it is a much better uh, foundation on which to base your choices, right? I've also seen um, ki- um, un- unschooled adults of my kids' generation change career paths just seamlessly um, because they don't look at it. Uh, they're not thinking about their lives in a box. So they, you know, one friend of my son's that he grew up with was a professional ballet dancer. And then when he was in his late 20s, he changed careers and he became an EMT. And I, last time I talked to him, he was study- probably going to study to become a nurse. And I've known other other young adults who have done similar things. Um, so to them, it's sort of like, well, if they want to change course, they just change course. It's not, it doesn't feel like a big insurmountable, like, oh my God, what do I do now? You know, it's kind of, again, the way they've always lived their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a failure to change course. Absolutely. yeah, it's just a choice, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm... And it doesn't mean I, I'd written an essay about this too. The whole thing of quitting just because somebody quits, it doesn't mean that there wasn't meaning and value in in whatever they did for the time they were doing it. Hmm. Um, yeah. No, that's huge, right? It's you. You're learning all the time, and uh, at, at any point, you're you may step in a different direction just because that's. That's where you are now. That's who you are now. I mean, I always go back to, you know, the fact that I I studied ballet, uh, you know, for like 13 years growing up for many, many hours, most, you know, evenings after school, et cetera, et cetera. And I did not become a professional dancer, <laughs> but none of that was lost. I mean, right. so much that I learned about myself, so uh, you know, just everything. There is nothing lost in that. Yeah. I think it's just sort of this tendency that many of us seem to have of being product oriented. Yeah, (laughs) Um, exactly. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, more sort of honoring the process, um, I think is. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to put it. Process over product, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and our last question here, uh, you have co-written a fiction book that came out this year called Unschoolers, and I've started reading it, and so far I'm having a lot of fun with it. I was wondering what inspired you guys to take that project on. 
Um, well, I wrote it with Sophia Sayeg, who's a very close friend and a colleague. We started a, um, a nonprofit together, um, uh, Advocates for Home Education in Massachusetts, which is the state where we homeschool. So we've been so we and we homeschooled our kids together. And um, we sat down one day and said, you know, we should write a book together. And it was actually Sophia's idea. She said, I think it should be fiction. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> so um, so one of the things that we, one of the questions that we would always hear is, well, what do, what do you do all day? What do homeschoolers do all day? And it's such a hard question to answer. Um, mm-hmm. And so we thought this is sort of a way to show that. Um, and also there's so, there's so little representation of homeschoolers and unschoolers in books and movies. And usually when they do show up there, it's just some stereotype. Um, so, so it was sort of, those were some of the motivations. Um, and, and, and it was really representative of sort of, of how, how, how we, how it was when we homeschooled also, it's so different now. Um, and so it's sort of, it's like a, almost like a historical record in some ways, even though it's fiction, (laughs) sort of like, this is, this was how it was for one moment in time. Um, and I feel like when I started homeschooling, it was in sort of an interesting time. It was right sort of after all the legal battles. I think the generation that came before, at least in the United States, was dealing with a, with some legal battles. And so um, a lot of people were underground. Or So by the time I started homeschooling, it was le- the legal stuff was pretty much done. And yet, but they weren't, but homeschoolers hadn't grown so much that we weren't seen as a market the way we are now. There's there's a lot, I feel like we've become a market, you know, people will market to us. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that just wasn't there. So it was this time where there weren't legal battles. So we could go out during the day <laughs> and yeah. um, we could do things together with the small number of families that were there, but we really were making our own community and we were making our own, you know, stuff. I mean, our own theater group, our own, you know, book groups, we would get together and read and, and and there was really nothing to sign your kid up for, although there were people who would go to like the local nature sanctuary and say, will you offer a class during the day? And, you know, now they just put it in their catalog because they figured out, oh, yeah, we can do this now. We put it in our catalog. But so it's not like it never happened, but it happened because there were people in the community who went and approached the museum and said, you know, mm-hmm. can we do something here during the day. Um so it was it was an it was an interesting time. It was like this little pocket, maybe of a decade, where there weren't all these options, these activities, these products, and yet um, we were able to, you know, be out in the open and um, and build this space. I think maybe in some areas that aren't as urban as where I live, it might still be more like that because um, I think the fact that I live in an urban area and that there's so many people homeschooling and that there's so many, um, you know, places popping up to cater to them. um, I think where that's less available, it might still be more like what we wrote about in the book. Um, but anyway, it, it was really fun to do. It was it was a fun book to write, and um, I hope people enjoy That's it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll definitely put a link to it in the show notes as well. Great. Well, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Milva. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. It was a delight. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. It was. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? So um, my blog is a apotlucklife.com. Um, and there's also, you can learn about the unschoolers. Well, you, both of my books are on the blog, but there's also unschoolersbook.com. And you can awesome. connect, you know, write to me through either of those. Excellent. I'll definitely put those in the show notes as well. Thank you very much. Have a great day, Milma. Thanks, Pam. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. 
reviewers have said, a quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning. This little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.